Our scripture lesson today is based in Genesis chapter 17 and 18. So if you want to open up your Bibles or your Bible app to Genesis 17 or 18, uh, that forms the foundation of where we'll be going uh, in, in several minutes. Uh, we will get there. As we talk today, as we continue our study of words about God, and the word for today is omnipotence. God has all power. In this study of the attributes of God, it's what it's called in theological circles, his characteristics, there are three that begin with the prefix O-M-N-I. And I have really been kind of living in these three attributes uh, as I've been working in this study. Last week, we talked about his omnipresence, that he is with us wherever we go. God is everywhere present at the same time. All that God is, he is wherever you are. And he is wherever I am. He is the omnipresent God. He is with me. Today, we're going to begin probably a two-parter on his omnipotence. That is, he has all power. And then we will look, Lord willing, at his omniscience. And that is, he knows everything. In fact, he knows if we'll be here in three weeks to do the study on omniscience. You know, he knows everything. And those three statements, God is with me, God is able, he has all power, and he knows best, those three statements should keep us grounded as believers in Christ as we live in such a chaotic, uncertain world. God is with me. He has all power, so he is able to deal with whatever's going on, and he knows best. And we can trust him and have that assurance because of that. So when we talk about his omnipotence, that he has all power, it means that he can do anything he wants to in harmony with his nature. It's the same as the word almighty. That word is used 56 times, depending on the translation of the Bible you have, and it is only used in reference to God. He is the Almighty One. Now, when I say God can do anything, the smart Alex here in the room, and the smart Alex watching online, and the smart Alex that were me and my classmates when we studied this, raised our hand and said, okay, so God can do anything, right? So can he make a square circle? Can he make a stone that has emotion? You know, we, you know no. Okay, God, there, there are three areas of limitations to God's power. He cannot do absurd or self-contradictory things. Okay, he can't make a square circle. You know, that, that's not what he's talking about. Secondly, he cannot do things contrary to his nature. I think that's important because I heard somebody say one time that a lot of times our prayer is, God, please don't let one plus one equal two. You know, it's like we know we've messed up and somehow we want God to just kind of ignore it. No, God can't do th things contrary to his nature. He could not overlook sin. He could not lie. You know, he could not do things contrary to his nature. And, and I want to sit here for a minute. He never crosses the free will of man. Man was created, and woman, humanity, was created as free moral agents. What that means is we have the ability to choose. If you don't think that's true, you've never raised children. You know, children are great illustrations of original sin, you know, and they are great illustrations of the fact that we are created with the ability to choose. Are we going to obey God, or are we not going to obey God? We have that choice, and God never takes that choice away from us. And there's a whole lot of really, in my opinion, bad theology out there because they misunderstand that concept that we are born with a free will. We can choose. God never makes us do something we don't want to do. And we have that freedom of choice 
until the last breath we draw. And God never overrides our ability to choose. Now, sometimes he puts things in place so that we become willing, you know, to make the right decision, but he doesn't make us do it. This is critically important as it relates to the area of prayer. How many times and for how many years have some of us been praying for a person or a situation and the answer doesn't seem to come. It's because God does not overrule and override a person's free will. And so that's why it's important to keep on praying. Because what does happen over time, and, and you may have had it happen in your own life, God brings situations to bear, he brings circumstances into people's lives. He brings people into people's lives that work together to cause them to want to change. And so when you're praying, you know, like if you're praying for a person that's away from God, a good prayer to pray is God bring some good Christians into their life. You know, some people that are good, solid, cool Christians that they will begin to have some barriers broken down and they'll have somebody that they can say, well, you know, if that's, if that person's a Christian, maybe it's not so bad to be a Christian and somebody that will listen to them, somebody that won't be judgmental, you know, it's good to bring, because that's part of the process of them becoming willing to make the right decision. But God never forces a person to do what they don't want to do. So keep on praying. And remember, God always respects the free choice. I heard a preacher with my own ears, I heard a preacher say, there will be people in heaven who don't even want to be there. Well, no. <laughs> you know, we, we have the choice. God never overrides that choice. So when we talk about God's omnipotence, there are three big areas where God's power has especially been shown. One is creation. It's one of the reasons creation is so important it is because it is a demonstration of the power of God. Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Let all the earth fear the Lord, for he spoke and it came to be. The great verse in Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm and nothing is too difficult for thee. The nothing is too difficult for thee is tied in to his creating power. And in Revelation chapter 4, when we get to heaven, part of our prayer will be, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The second area where his power is demonstrated is in the area of miracles. Uh, we see the miracle of the virgin birth and the angel saying to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. The, the central miracle of the Old Testament is the crossing of the Red Sea. Anytime that an Old Testament prophet or God through a prophet wanted to remind Israel of God's power, he always references the crossing of the Red Sea. The central miracle of the New Testament is, of course, the resurrection of Christ. And anytime a New Testament writer wants to remind us of the power of God, he always hearkens back to the resurrection of Christ. And, and you, it'll be an interesting study for you as you read through the Bible to notice that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the third area of God's power is the area of redemption, our salvation. Romans chapter 1, the gospel of Christ is the power of of God to salvation. Ephesians 1 and 2 tell us that the power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that raised us to spiritual life. There's an old song that said, it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. So we thank God for his miraculous power.
If you're not familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah, I encourage you to go back to the Mother's Day sermon this year. It's the second Sunday of May of 2021. We studied Sarah and we referenced her and we referenced Hagar last week a couple of times. But I want to go back to that story specifically from Genesis 17 and 18 and the perspective of, of God's omnipotence, his power, as it relates to the birth of Isaac. And the question is Genesis 18, 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Very abbreviated Cliff Notes version of the story. Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham and Sarah, and he says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, as numerous as the sands of the seashore, as the stars in the heavens. That's Genesis chapter 12. Abraham is 75. Sarah is 65. Well, 10 years pass. There's no stars. There's no sand. There's no air. That's when Hagar gets into the picture. 14 years after Hagar, we come to Genesis 17 and 18. It's now been 24 years since Genesis 12. Abraham is now 99. Sarah is 89. And God comes to them, Genesis chapter 18, verse 10, at about this time next year, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And it says she was listening at the entrance to the tent, and uh, she laughed. <laughs> well, Genesis 17, which is the same basic story, the angel tells Abraham about this time next year, Sarah's going to give you a son, and Abraham laughed. So there's a lot of laughter going on when the angel tells them, y'all getting ready to have a baby at 99 and 89, and you're going to have a baby when you're 100 and when you're 90. <laughs> and that's when the angel says, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll return to you at the appointed time next year. Sarah will have a son. 25 years from the promise to the birth of the promised son, Isaac. If there's anything that story tells us is God delights in beating the odds. God delights in messing up our assumptions. And so let's talk about that question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is not the only time when God beat the odds. God loves to beat the odds. And you can think through the Bible stories that you're familiar with. You think about Gideon versus the Midianites. The Midianites were described in the scripture as thick as locusts. You could not even count their camels, let alone their soldiers. You can read about that in Judges chapter 7. Gideon's army begins with 32,000 soldiers. God says that's too many. It's a fascinating story if you want to read it in Judges chapter 7, how Gideon ends up with 300 and against the Midianites, who were as thick as locusts, Gideon's 300 are given a great victory because God loves to overcome the odds. David and Goliath, you know the story, 1 Samuel 17. Goliath is somewhere between 9 and a half and 10 and a half feet tall. His armor weighed 125 pounds. The point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. David has a slingshot. Who are you going to bet on? Well, God delights in beating the odds. And you can think about the story after story after story in Scripture of how God loves beating the odds. He loves to mess up our assumptions. I do not know where I found this, the man's name is Douglas Rumford, and I, I found him on, in, in this study somewhere talking about the assumptions that Abraham and Sarah made that are assumptions that we often make ourselves, and God loves to just blow up our assumptions. 
One of them is that God will work within a certain time frame. You know, we, you know, we have a word from God and we think that's going to happen today or tomorrow. Again, it was 25 years from promise to fulfillment for Abraham and Sarah. Second Peter chapter three, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Habakkuk is told, though it tarries, wait for it. We have that assumption that God's going to work, work within a certain time frame. He thinks in terms of calendars and generations. We think in terms of stopwatches, and, and we get frustrated. In the heyday of some tremendously great pastors in London, we know Charles Spurgeon's name, but a, another one was R.W. Dale. And, and I read some stories on, on his life several years ago. And one day he was pacing back and forth in his office and doing it rather intensely, so much so that his secretary in the outer office heard it and knocked on the door and came in and said, Pastor Dale, what's wrong? And he said, plenty's wrong. I'm in a hurry and God isn't. You know? And sometimes that's kind of the way it is, right? God doesn't work within our time frame. Second, we assume that God's work is tied to our abilities. You know, the angel says, you're going to have a son. Sarah says, wait a minute, Abraham's an old man. I'm an old lady. We can't physically have children. We're too old. In other words, God, you gave me this promise and I got to figure out how I'm going to make it work. How many times do we do that? We have a word from the Lord and we set about figuring out, wait a minute now, how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that? No, God's work is not tied to my abilities. Aren't you glad? <laughs> God's work is not tied to your abilities. His work in your life is not dependent on your abilities. Aren't you glad that your limitations aren't God's limitations? His work is not tied to our ability to try to figure something out. We assume that what we see is real. Now, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight, but let's be honest, too many times, even those of us who are people of faith tend to walk by sight and not by faith, and we can't see it. Sarah says, I can't see how this is going to work out. We need to understand that our challenge is to keep our eyes fixed on things above, not on the things of the earth. It's one of the reasons we come to church, is to remind ourselves what the real reality is and what the capital T, truth, is. God is not tied to what we see. And if we're not careful, we make an assumption that God only works through people who never fail, who never mess up. Abraham messed up, read the story. Sarah messed up read the story. But God still used Abraham and Sarah. And God can still use you and me. And sometimes when God gives us a word, we think, oh, that can't be for me because, man, 20 years ago, this and this and this. No, God doesn't work through perfect people or he wouldn't work through any of us. God can work through each of us. And I love the fact that in Genesis 21, it says the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did what he'd promised, and she bears a son. And in chapter 17, God had told them, name him Isaac. Now remember, when Abraham is told, you and Sarah are going to have a son, the Bible says he laid down, face down, on the ground, and laughed. I have a picture in my mind, you know, that he's, he's kind of banging his fists on the ground and kicking his feet. Ah, 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 I'm going to have a kid when I'm 100. Yeah. And, and then in chapter 18, Sarah laughs. God tells them, name your son Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter. And I think what God is saying in that is this. There is a truth that brings laughter from heaven. And that is, this is too hard for God. And he laughs. And he says, let me show you. A lot of times we talk about senior moments when we kind of forget things. I want to encourage us to have some Isaac moments. When we remember 
how God beat the odds and the miracles that we have experienced in our lives. Now, that laughter won't always be immediate, but our faith tells us nothing is too hard for God, and he knows what's best, and he has the power to bring it to pass. Now, all that's introduction. Now I want to get to what the Bible study is today. I did a word study on that verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And I found out that that word hard is the same Hebrew word that's translated in other places in the Scripture, in the Old Testament, wondrous or wondrous works. Huh. So it's saying, is anything too wondrous for the Lord? Is there anything that you can think of that's so outrageous that God can't do it? Is anything too difficult for God? And so I went through and looked at what the Scripture says when he uses those phrases, wondrous or wondrous deeds or wondrous works, and I came up with one, two, three, four, five statements that I really want us to take home with us today. Number one, God and God alone does wonders. I realized when I looked at the notes that I did not put the scripture references in. So if you want to take notes, write real quickly, or you can come back to this section of the tape and slow it down and and, and write the notes, because I want you to have these references, because I know some of you use these notes as kind of a devotional through the week. God and God alone does wonders. Job 9.10. God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Psalm 136, 4. To him alone who does great wonders. Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you've planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. And you can put amen by that, right? Psalm 86, verse 10. You are great and you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. So no wonder the children of Israel sang Exodus 15, 11. Who is like unto thee? O Lord among the gods, who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. God does wondrous things. Second, we should praise God for those wondrous deeds. Psalm 107, several times, verse 8, verse 15, verse 21, and verse 31 All says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for men. Psalm 26, verse 7. I proclaim aloud your praise, and I tell of all your wonderful deeds. We should praise God for those wonderful deeds. How long has it been since you said thank you to God. I try to do that because I need to refresh my faith. And I encourage you that that just sometime in your prayer time, when you're feeling a little stale and your prayer time feels a little like, oh, this is just what I said yesterday, go back as far as you can go back and think about some specific times that you were praying about something and God answered. And just walk through your history with the Lord, thanking Him for those miracles. We should thank Him and praise Him for His wonderful deeds. And maybe this should have been the second one. We should meditate on those wondrous deeds. Maybe we should meditate on them first and then thank God for them. But Psalm 37, verse 14, stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? 
Stop and consider God's wonders. And David said, Psalm 145, verse 5, I will meditate on your wonderful works. Spend some time thanking God. Spend some time reviewing what God has done for you in the past. It will build your faith for what you're asking for him to do in the future. Because my goodness, how many times in your life did you think, I don't know if I can survive this. I don't know if I can make it through. I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep my sanity going through this. And you prayed and God came through and here you are. Maybe a little worse for wear, but you know, here you are. And God is still with us. And the same God who worked with you yesterday is going to work with you and for you today and tomorrow because God does these wondrous deeds to increase our faith in him. That's why I encourage you to remember. Just go through and remember. You know, when you didn't have a job and then you got it, or when you're Kids were laid off and then they got something better or, you know, just, just the times that God has come through. You know, those things are not coincidences, people. You know, when things happen after you pray, that's not a coincidence. And it's so important that we remember them so that our faith can be built. The great illustration of that is Joshua chapter 3 when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River. And in and, and Joshua 3, verse 5, that word for wondrous is used, but it's translated amazing. Tomorrow, when they cross the Jordan River on dry ground, the Lord will do amazing things among you. And while the Jordan River is separated, and the million-plus Jews cross on dry ground, God says, before I put the waters back together, go down to that riverbed and get 12 stones and build a monument on this side of the Jordan River. And in the days to come, when your children ask, we used to live on that side of the river. How did we get to this side of the river? I don't see a bridge. You point to those rocks and tell them where they came from and tell them about the miracle. That increases your faith. And as we tell others, of God's wondrous deeds, it increases their faith. See, God doesn't do a miracle for you so you can keep it to yourself. We should tell others of God's wondrous deeds. Psalm 78, verse 4. We will tell the next generation the awesome deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. One of the reasons God does wondrous things for us is so that we can pass on that heritage to the generations to come. Those stories, I'm not going to tell you the sewing machine story. I've told you it several times recently. But, but the, you know, tell the stories of what God has done for you. Tell them to your kids. Tell them to your grandchildren. The greatest inheritance you can pass on is an inheritance of let me tell you what God did for our family and you can trust him with yours. Back to the original question, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No, there is nothing too difficult for him. In the New Testament, Jesus says to his disciples, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, with God, all things are possible. The angel, as we mentioned when we began, to Mary in Luke chapter 1, for God, nothing is impossible with God. So let's bring this down to today. What's the big problem in your life today? What wondrous deeds do you need God to do for you today? That thing that has you tossing and turning at night, that thing that is there when you close your eyes at night, and that thing that's there when you wake up first thing, what is that thing in your life that seems too difficult for you? Now, what is that thing in your life that is too difficult for you? 
It's not too difficult for God. And I love the verses in Jeremiah chapter 32. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Great are your purposes. Mighty are you deeds. And a few verses down, God says, Jeremiah 32, 27, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? I don't know that we know this chorus, but there's a little basic chorus that comes out of these verses. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for thee. And so if you came in today carrying a heavy burden, if you're listening and watching, and I don't know when it may be, it may be years from 2021, and you feel that you just can't take another step, please know there's nothing too difficult for God. He is all powerful. And with his help, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Father, that you are the all-powerful, almighty, miracle-working God. As the prophet said, you are the God who does miracles. You display your power among the people. And Lord, we need to see some of that miracle-working power in our lives, in the lives of our nation. And we just pray, Father, that your power would be shown for those who are listening now, whether it's live here in the building or whether it's in a future day, who need to know your power in a very specific way. I ask you to do that miracle. I ask you to do that wonderful deed because we know that there's nothing too difficult for you. Thank you for that. And Lord, that doesn't minimize the burdens we're carrying. That does not minimize the challenges we're facing, but it maximizes our God. And so may we stay focused on you and experience your mighty power, I pray. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. Thanks for tuning in. You're dismissed.